We are a group, uh, like a politically independent group of doctors and medical students here in Australia. That's about a thousand strong. And what we do is promote health through protection of the environment. And our fo focuses have primarily been recently, it's on climate change, on air pollution, on preserving biodiversity, as well as also um, preserving, like basically cleaning up our own house and working on hospital sustainability. So I think as doctors working in the area of um, uh, climate change, what we're doing is learning to talk um, to our patients about um, protecting the environment, not directly through that, but by tackling some of the health issues that come along with it. So in particular, talking about the health co-benefits, um, actions which improve health, such as eating less red meat, um, more active transport, such as uh, walking or cycling. And those actions, as a result, are helpful for um, the environment. So, so just to give you my background, so I basically started off in international child health, and it was about uh, 2009, actually, when I took a public health course, which basically connected the dots between the environment and health, and why, with climate change, with all of its... Um, uh, the, the negative health impacts of climate change really made it very clear for me why climate change had become a health issue. Um, so just briefly, some of you may have heard this. So back even back in 2002, the World Health Organization had already estimated that there were 160,000 extra deaths or additional deaths due to climate change. In particular, um, and, and the reason we were, I was involved particularly is because I realized that 90% of those deaths actually occurred in children, and almost 100% occurred in the in um, third world or low in middle income countries. Um, and by kind of mid-century 2050, we are predicting to have an additional 250 to 400,000 extra deaths per year just from malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, and heat stress. Um, and again, most of that burden will fall on children. So I'm just going to skip through this. I think many of you already realize this is from World Mapper. I love these sorts of maps. Um, this is 2005 already, but this is basically um, who is responsible for emissions of greenhouse gas in the world. And as you can see, United States, um, Australia, um, China is growing big, India is growing big over there, um, Africa is quite small. But also, where are the health impacts of climate change? And that's where it's being seen. So primarily what we see is you know, clearly African countries, but also Southeast Asia. Um, so but, uh, going back, so why are health and environment, the environment and health linked? I might move this table, that's OK, because essentially I'm about to on. So as we know, nature, basically nature provides the ultimate foundations of health and life. So humans have a fundamental need, as we know, for food, water, clean water, clean air, shelter, and relative climate consistency. Um, and nature has had a very clever, nature has systematically and very cleverly programmed within it systems to detoxify nutrient and waste processing and detoxification, and also regulates its diseases. And as a result, we benefit from the recreational opportunities, as well as the mental, cultural, and spiritual health that we get from nature. Um, and this is um, where I work. So plants, you know, the title of this talk is Embracing a Plant-Rich Diet. Um, how nature and plants actually have um, health promoting properties. <coughs> so this is the Royal Children's Hospital. It is set in parkland, and it is basically a hospital within a park. And there's also a park within the hospital. So the building is designed to reflect the colors of the surrounding trees and nature. And there's um, an abundance of natural light and air flowing through it. And all, almost all of the rooms have a view of the outdoors. So just going into more about global, the global state of um, food security and uh, nutrition. So until about maybe five years ago, the, um, 
um, the FAO, um, which is the, oh gosh, I'm just losing it, the, uh, the Food, Food Agriculture Organization, thank you, um, defined really malnutrition primarily as undernutrition. And it was really, there, um, um, yeah, probably about five years ago, they started putting in indices of overnutrition as well. So now we're saying malnutrition ranges, not just from the severe un undernutrition that we're seeing in some of those um, low and middle income countries, but we're also seeing the surge of obesity and overweightness in the world. Um, so in terms of global statistics, about 11% of the global population is actually undernourished. Um, with about 25% of children chronically undernourished or stunted. So stunted is when you're chronically undernourished and you don't grow to your full height potential. Um, and that's a permanent condition. These children, even if fed, will never get that back. And we have two to three billion, which is almost half the world, with micro micronutrient deficiencies. So deficiency in iron, zinc, vitamins, those sorts of things. But on the flip side, often in the same country, even sometimes in the same household, you have, we have over, almost 20% of the world's children who have, are overweight now, and that cuts across not just uh, developed countries, but also um, low and middle income countries. And we've got 40% of the world's global population of adults um, being overweight, with one third of that 40% actually falling into the range of obesity. Um, if you take a look at this graph, um, so the world is, um, this is a percentage of, of, of um, overweightness, um, and this, this dotted line, excuse me, of, of obesity, this dotted line is sort of the world average. Um, this is uh, North America and Europe. This purple line is Oceania, or the Pacific, um, and this is, Asia is the lowest, Africa is the next lowest over there. But as you can see, through the years, all of these, um, this prevalence is rising. And it's, as you know, well studied that with overnutrition, um, we have high degrees of cardiovascular disease. So high blood pressure, diet, um, high blood pressure, cardiac um, conditions, and um, like heart attacks, strokes type two diabetes, kidney disease. Um, many cancers are associated with um, uh, weight, um, excessive weight. So breast, ovarian, and a lot of the endocrine, um, or um, the endocrine and reproductive cancers, as well as the, a lot of the ones of the, of the um, intestines, so the gastric cancers and the colorectal. Um, musculoskeletal, um, uh, uh, comorbidities are actually probably under-recognized, so that's more like the hip and the knee joints and how those give out much more readily with um, obesity. Significant sleep issues as well, so sleep apnea um, and lung disease, poor mental health. And I think in summary, the global economic cost of obesity is absolutely enormous. It is two trillion dollars annually. And that's almost the same amount as smoking essentially. And so how is this happening? So global diets are shifting towards overconsumption. Um, see? So basically this black line is the world. You can see over time and basically people are consuming more calories. So this is the US, this is Europe, but you can see China starting to come up, Ethiopia, so even the lower income countries are really starting to rise. The world itself has become more um, uh, food has become more abundant. And particularly in animal-based proteins, we're seeing the same. So this is sort of the world average, but see, Indonesia is climbing up, Nigeria is climbing up, China is climbing up, Japan is climbing up as well. And most people are getting far more protein than they need. So the daily requirements for an adult for protein <coughs> is about 50 to 60 grams a day. And so that's what this black line is here. And um, is, this is about the, the grams of protein consumed per capita per day. You, this is the average daily protein requirement. So anything above that is sort of excess protein that people are consuming. Um, so this is the US and Canada. We um, and here's the EU, so we're all up in here. Um, the um, other OECD countries, 
um, are about here. Um, and then the green represents the plant where we, the source of the proteins. So the green is the um, plant-based proteins and the red is the animal-based proteins. So as you can also see that we are getting probably about half of our protein from animal-based sources. Um, and so back, even back in 2015, Australia was actually crowned the um, meat capital of the world. So we eat, um, not personally, but we eat about not, almost 100 kilograms of meat a day, uh, a year. And if you average that out, that's about 250 grams a day, um, which is four to five times the recommended daily protein uh, recommendations. I think other data on Australia. So um, Nutrition Australia, about 60% 60, 60 of adults um, here are overweight or obese. Um, this graph here shows basically fruit and vegetable consumption. So um, as opposed to the um, meat uh, consumption, this is by age, so two to four, four to eight, I know this probably doesn't show up very well, nine to 15. So these are the kids and these are the adults age groups. This is how, what percentage actually meet their fruit requirement per day. And so you can see it kind of dips down here and then kind of goes back up. Um, and this percentage is what percent of kids like this age or adults this age meet their vegetable requirements here. So, um, so less than 4% adults and less than 1% of children eat the minimum recommended servings of fruit and veg every day. Um, and the other, I think, in Australia, one, over one-third of total energy intake comes from what we call discretionary foods. Um, and this is, this is the um, ABS, this is the Bureau of Statistics here in Australia. And that accounts for a significant proportion of the diet-related like water use, uh, global uh, like um, greenhouse gas emissions, and land use as well. We'll get into that. So that's just our picture of what we're facing. Many of you are probably already familiar with this, so basically the global food system that is currently in place. Um, so basically evolved since the last half of the year, since sort of World War II, with increasing industrialization of agriculture. Um, and it's been driven by a need for food security, but also by big business. I don't know if any, have you, any of you read Fast Food Nation or heard of it? This is the US. Um, and I read this, what, 15 years ago or something. And it was talking about the rise of McDonald's and how successful it was. Um, and because it became so successful, it, it was such a, a player in US agriculture, it could actually drive and influence um, agricultural production. So it could drive the chicken industry to produce chickens with bigger breast sizes. It basically owned half of the potato market, you know, from its French potato, what do you call them here? French chips, you know, French fries. Um, and so by being such a big industry, it basically could push and bully the agricultural industry into doing what it wanted. As a result of some of this, what we've what has resulted is very energy rich, um, which is like calorie rich, but very poor nutrient crops. So like poor in vitamins and minerals. And, and basically we've been driven, the, the goal of it has shifted, um, of, of the agricultural system, has shifted from providing actual food to providing food for livestock and the food processing industry. So in the States, it's corn syrup, and here it's the sugar cane to be put into processed food. Do we, does anybody know what percentage of food grown here in Australia is actually gets to the table as food? It's one third. Hmm? So it, one third is wasted and two thirds. Yeah, well, um, so if you actually count calories, it's about 50% of food, here, maybe I'll show you, 50% of calories grown are actually brought onto the table as food, and about 35% is actually put into feed for livestock, and then biofuels is another 10%. I'll show you, let's see. So this doesn't show up very well, but so here, yeah, food. Um, what percent of the food actually grown is turns into food and what goes into feed and fuel? So in the U.S. particularly, um, only about 30% in the U.S. is actually put on the table and the rest is turned into feed and fuel. 
Um, in Africa, most of it actually goes to being eaten. And where is Australia in here? So some of it is sort of in there. Yeah, so it's very interesting. Um, and then along with this um, industrialization, you get widespread irrigation, um, fossil fuel-based inputs. So all that fertilizer is all nitrogen-based fertilizer, and it's very greenhouse gas intensive to create. Um, and mechanization, um, oops, sorry. And also transport, adding more to green food, food transport, adding more to greenhouse gases. Then you get technology and government policies that favor a limited number of crops. So certain species of corn, certain species, the most hardy um, types of strawberries that don't necessarily taste like much, but they are they can be transported from place to place. And so what that's um, what we've basically done is eliminate di biodiversity in favor of this um, big food system. So what it did was initially increase our food yields, which benefited human health. But what now we're seeing um, quite a wide range of negative environmental and health um, effects from that. Um, so the food, system, basically food system impact on agriculture. Um, agricultural activities occupy 40 to 50% of the land's like Earth's land surface, and accounts for 70% of human freshwater use. And um, um, importantly, accounts for somewhere between a fifth to a third of um, our global greenhouse gas emissions. And of that, over 80% is attributed to livestock production. Um, in Australia, about 60% of our land is dedicated to agriculture, of which 95% of that is uh, livestock grazing. Um, and Account, uh, agriculture accounts for about 20% of our total greenhouse gases. So what it does to the environment, so greenhouse, just direct greenhouse gas emissions from methane production, we call it enteric fermentation or kind of farts, as well as nitrous oxide. So though in the agriculture role sort of sector, methane and nitrous oxide are the bigger greenhouse gases. It's less so the carbon dioxide. Um, so carbon dioxide lasts in the in the environment in the atmosphere about 100 um, years. Um, methane and nitrous oxide are shorter lived, but they're actually very potent in terms of their um, insulating properties. Um, we've also got um, fertilizer production, as well as the food, like I said earlier, food processing, transport, refrigeration, packaging, retailing, all of that. Um, it's also, our food system has also led to a significant amount of deforestation. So we're clearing the land, either for production of feed or grazing for livestock. Also desertification, so diversion, I don't have to say this in Australia, but diverting water basically to irrigate. Um, and lastly, habitat fragmentation. Um, so it's breaking up natural habitats and we lose our biodiversity. So not only the monoculture crops, but lots of pesticides and the loss of natural insects and plant species. Um, and then the pollution that's associated with all of the agriculture. Um, so the nitrate and phosphorus chemical fertilizers, feedlots, which we have a lot in the US, I don't think there are that many feedlots here, um, leading to proven cases of cancer um, and birth defects. We've got lots of heavy metals leaching out of the soil, so you get the arsenic and mercury and lead, um, which for children is um, really inhibits brain development. Um, there's lots of endocrine disrupting chemicals, so lots of the hormones that we've used in like in the meats in particular, um, in chickens and, and beef, uh, has been associated with um, reproductive cancers and diabetes. Um, and then air pollution, which is the largest, or depending on where you look, the second largest contributor of outdoor air pollution in some countries. The other um, impacts on health, so uh, zoonotic illnesses, so basically animal-based or animal-hosted um, illnesses. So mad cow disease in the UK, remember? Even now, I think if you've been in the UK in the last 10 years, you're not allowed to donate blood, is that right? And then, in the 1990s? Yeah, something yeah. like that, right, right. And, and people getting sick off of, the, off of that. Um, e. coli, salmonella, all the jack-in-the-box, um, uh, outbreaks and things like that. We've breeded, um, from a hospital point of view, um, the routine use of antibiotics has actually bred quite a bit of antibiotic resistance 
Um, and there are many antibiotics that we can't use in the hospital now for like E. coli or Shigella because they just don't work anymore. Um, there are the occupational hazards of those in the agriculture industry, so the injuries, heat, airborne particles, the chemicals, as well as the mental health effects. So as you all know, what we're seeing in the, during the droughts um, in New South Wales and Victoria and how that has uh, led to a higher, higher mental health, uh, deterioration of mental health and, and suicide rates amongst farmers. Um, and then also the unhealthy dietary patterns. How much time do I have left? Okay, okay. all right. So, so I think the other thing to emphasize is that not all meat, what do we say, men are, all men are created equal? Not all meat is actually created equally. So, um, so the green is the amount of land used um, per, uh, to create um, a ton of, the per ton of protein consumed. This is, uh, the blue is the water use, and this orange here is the greenhouse gas um, emissions per ton of protein consumed. So this is pulses. These are the lentils, the beans, the soy, um, as opposed to beef. So beef is actually probably one of the biggest culprits, depending on which statistic you use. Um, 20 to 100 times more um, land and water consumed and emits uh, 20 to 100 times more greenhouse gases compared to your pulses here. Uh, you've got poultry and pork, which are approximately three times more compared, three times compared to the legumes, not like 20, but more like three. And then the fish, fish as well. Uh, so uh, um, beef in particular, beef and lamb and mutton are primarily um, very energy intensive. If beef was its own country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter after China and the US. I guess also food, um, other further considerations. So food wastage, as somebody said earlier, um, one third of the food of food that is produced is actually wasted at various points of production or distribution. Um, and what it does is it exacerbates already the environmental impact of the food system and accounts for 8% of global greenhouse gases. And then I think also in the future, we are expecting the world population to increase to almost 10 billion by mid-century, and which basically means that we need to increase our annual crop and livestock production by 50 to 70 percent to meet that need. So this is why I've been asked to come today. Has the has drawdown been brought up already um, during the conference, I assume. So as you know, um, uh, Drawdown basically is a book and a website, and I'm wiggling a little bit here, of the 100 most, I guess, impactful actions that people can take to make an impact on climate change. And of that, um, number four is um, adopting a plant-rich diet. So I think maybe in a nutshell, this is really what it does. This is what I call the health co-benefits of a adopting a plant-rich diet. So if consumption of meat, this is in the U a study in the UK. If consumption of meat, dairy, and eggs were halved, you get both the health benefit, saturated fat intake could be reduced by 40%, and what we see is an expected decrease in obesity, in heart disease, in diabetes, and some cancers. But at the same time, you get greenhouse gas reductions by 25%, nitrogen emission reductions by 40, and cropland use decreases by at least 25%. And that, that's just in the UK. Um, there have been other similar studies, so modeling studies um, back in, in um, 2009 that said if there was a 30% reduction in livestock, um, then already the UK 15% decrease in heart disease, so heart attacks, and this many lives saved every year. Same thing in Sao Paulo, Brazil, 16% decrease in heart disease, and that many deaths saved per year. And that's how many years of life saved. So if somebody, if life expectancy is 80 and somebody dies at the age of 45, that's 35 years saved. So that's of productive years saved. So that's a lot of 
productive years of life by people saved. These are all the studies just from 2012, um, basically talking about um, how um, sustainable, sustainable dietary patterns affect human health in terms of um, decreases in mortality rate, decreases in heart disease, diabetes, colorectal cancer, and years of life lo lo lives lost. And that's going to either vegan, vegetarian diet, or here, meat partly replaced by other foods. And basically, in summary, transitioning to a more plant-based diet could reduce global mortality by five to 20 percent and lead to one trillion dollars of health care costs saved annually. Um, and then in terms of emissions, so uh, estimated greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so with this is a, a meat uh, greater than 100 grams of meat per day and that's sort of carbon dioxide equivalents up here, uh, reducing that to meat um, less than 50 grams a day, I think I said um, 50 grams a day was the kind of protein requirement. Already, even a reduction from over 100 grams down to just over 50, um, look at that drop in greenhouse gas emissions. And then if you go down to fish, that's how, how much you're saving. And then if you go to a vegetarian or a vegan diet here. So significant, about 70% drop in greenhouse gas emissions if you kind of go all the way down. Also similar reductions in land use and water. And I think the other benefit that we don't, there's so many other benefits to it. One of them is cost. So thinking about how much people spend on food um, in Australia, and it is a, a high amount. We probably spend in our diets about, um, in our households about 15, percent on of our, our, our um, income on food uh, on on food dropping that down to legumes so a qu per pound hundred uh, one dollar versus like sort of five dollars per pound uh, for beef um, and even especially in the lowest income bracket they spend almost 20 percent of their household income on food so I think on a global um, scale the have people heard of the sustainable development goals so they're uh, put in place in 2015 for uh, 2030. Um, it's talking about no poverty, zero hunger, good health, well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water sanitation, avoidable clean energy, all of these things, industry, innovation, infrastructure, um, sustainable cities and communities. Sustainable agriculture, if we were able to achieve that, basically helps all of these goals in one way or another. Um, so environmental protection, sustainable agriculture have all been rolled up into this zero hunger right here. Let's see. So with this is um, our this is doctors for the environment. Basically, our statements, our goals, our vision for what we want this to look like. So um, our three main goals are to provide all human beings with food that is affordable, nutritious, and culturally acceptable. To minimize the adverse environmental effects of food production by transitioning to a sustainable management of land, um, regenerating um, degraded lands, that's it's supposed to be a D, avoid clearing and minimizing pesticides and fertilizers, and improving resilience of the, of the agriculture and food systems to adverse weather events and climate change. And this will require a very coordinated and intersectoral approach. The way to do this, I think, to develop strategies for food production that minimize environmental and direct human health impacts, decrease the overall amount of meat produced and consumed, um, to decrease the overall amount of highly processed food consumed, and to reduce food waste. I think. I think. Um, I think. I think. The, there are some difficulties with this, um, and from an individual level, I think food, and in particular meat, 
in particularly meat, um, has very strong cultural and social meaning here. Like what I see in my clinic practice all the time, you get these kids, these parents bringing their kids in, and these kids are healthy and they're running around and do, and the parents are like, look, he looks so sickly, he doesn't eat much meat. Like, and it's always around meat. It's like, he doesn't eat much meat, he just looks so, and he's just, you know, he's just fine, really, you know? But they, they see this as he's not eating enough meat, that translates into poor health. So that's their, um, that's their vision of what health is. Um, I think the cultural meaning of meat is also, it's a reflection of financial success. It's also a reflection of generosity towards other people, like when you come in. So we built our, our, um, our paradigm of success and of food around meat and three veg. And I think that needs to change. Um, I think there's a very popular perception of vegetarianism and um, being vegan as, as subtraction, like food, like, like um, it's, it's bec taking things away from your diet and it's um, a, uh, almost an apology for food rather than actually enhancing um, the, and, and promoting the um, attractiveness of a more plant-based diet. So plant-based options must be available, accessible, visible, enticing and attractive and fulfilling and, prob and probably will need to include some high quality meat substitutes. And I think in the end, um, we need to emphasize, so I don't think it's necessarily appropriate or um, feasible to um, say everybody needs to go vegetarian or vegan, but we really need to emphasize just shifts in the diet rather than total elimination. And that's what things like Meatless Monday do. Um, and so here's some things from Meatless <coughs> Monday. For every burger skipped, you can save, for every hamburger skipped, you can save enough water to shower for the next three and a half weeks. You know, that sort of thing. Um, and if we could put more posters around like this, um, if the world reduced meat consumption by 15%, just like one day, Meatless Monday, it'd have the same impact of taking away 240 million cars off the road each year. I mean, so those sorts of things. So it's not eliminating it entirely, but it's to say even if you cut down. Um, and so here, sorry, here's just some alternatives that we've made. Give me two more minutes. <laughs> um, here, so we've gotten to, um, Beyond Meat, you know, the plant, the pea protein, this is just being introduced in Australia now, pea protein um, extracts. And then uh, you've probably all seen this, is, is meat actually being grown, at, cultured in the laboratory. They're starting to culture it. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's coming. Um, and we can have other debates about that, <laughs> you know, about whether we should. The other thing about Australia, the good thing is, even though we are still eating 100 kilograms of meat a day, the amount of beef, oh, sorry, bread is a beef, beef is coming down, lamb is coming down, mutton is coming down, but chicken, chicken is starting to go up. Um, and where's my pork? My pork line was here. It's kind of right, right in here. So those are, so we are making shifts toward more sustainable sort of forms of meat. Um, and then, actually, this is from SBS. More than 10% of Australians are actually vegetarian now. It's 11 and a half percent. So it's not a you know it's not a small it's not fringe it's it's mainstream. I think the other thing that my friend Maria and I were having a conversation yesterday. She pointed out is, is I'm trying actually. I realize that this much of this talk is talking about sort of pulling down meat, but what we also need to do is enhance the culture around vegetables and, and plants and, and growing native things. So this is 11 talks on the transformative power of vegetables and community gardens and the Darabin Fruit Squad and how by promoting more food, like food in our communities, how we're creating um, healthier communities, we're creating communities that talk and socialize and take care of one another. And the health benefits of that are, um, are, are enormous. So I think um, the policy, what we say in policy is that we need a coordinated um, intersectoral approach to food policy that integrates public health and climate change mitigation. 
um, and environmental protection. Um, I think I'll skip some of them, but prioritizing research, um, adopting <coughs> strategy strategies that minimize the environmental effects of animal agriculture and preserve water resources. I think some of the more interesting ones though here, appropriate governmental regulation and oversight of fishing, um, support programs that nurture physical and mental health, um, introduce widespread measures to reduce food waste. Oh, where am I? I'm trying to get to the ones that I want here. Here, I think the most important here. Um, what policy can do is basically we need mechanisms for food pricing and access which reflect the true cost of food. So um, the true cost of the, if you add in the health costs of obesity, if you add in the health costs, the environmental costs of, of um, cleaning up degraded land, then that um, hamburger or that McDonald's Big Gulp, the 7-Eleven Big Gulp, won't look as good as that apple in terms of cost. Like I've had kids come in to my clinical room carrying around their two liter soda can and, and they're saying, and, and the families are saying, we can't afford fresh fruit and vegetables, but you could afford that. You know what I mean? And so if you actually give them what it really, if, if it really, you know, if it costs them the true cost of a soda, they may actually have a banana instead. Um, so I think that's really what I'm going to say. I think, here we go. So this is what I'm saying, bringing down the price of food and veg by basically factoring in the true cost of what that is and taking down the cost of that proportionately. Um, have people heard of a meat tax? Oh, go ahead, yeah. Uh, I presume uh, uh, mechanisms for pricing is a polite way of saying taxes. Oh, uh, well, yeah, we're kind of, well, I guess so, yeah, 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 that, that is it. I hadn't heard of a meat tax, actually, until until this. So some people call them sort of sin taxes, um, similar to what they did with tobacco and alcohol. Yeah, so some people are saying a meat tax is actually inevitable here. This is actually from the UK. Sugar tax? Sugar tax, sugar yeah, tax, please, that's please. right, that's right. Um, and then here, this is um, the, um, Stephanie Alexander, the food gardens in the schools. Yep, I'll stop there. And so here's my last slide. Here, this is Michael Pollan. Yeah. For anyone who's read Michael Pollan, this is my favorite. Eat food, not too much, mostly. Thanks. Right, thank, thank you very much. much.